morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And it is my great honor and privilege to be the pastor of the Way Christian Center, Los Angeles. Um, it means so much to me to be so connected to the very place, the Way Christian Center, Berkeley, the very place that molded and shaped me into being the believer that I am today, the seminary student who I was um, a few years ago, and the pastor that I am now. I give great thanks and praise to God, to Pastor Mike, to Pastor Donna, to all the pastors of the way, to all of you who have supported me and who are supporting our ministry. And of course, I say hey to my The Way Christian Center, Los Angeles family, congregation members, friends, family. Thank you for your support. We've been in existence for just one year, a little bit over a year, and we are so excited. Like It has been such an amazing journey to watch what God is doing through our community, and we are looking forward to seeing all of what God is going to do um, with us and through us. So with all of that gratitude, let's go to God in prayer. To the one who not only knows us, but knew us before we were in our mother's womb. To the one who journeys with us while navigating all the various plans for our hopes and futures where liberation flows so freely. To the one who promises peace and unspeakable joy, we say thank you. God, thank you for our ability to rest and the knowing that on Christ, the solid rock we stand, which helps us to know that we know that we know that you will place our feet on higher ground. Oh God, in this moment in life where you are lifting us up, helping us stand, keeping us from falling, remind us that our soul is anchored in you. Oh God, we need you. We need to see you. We need to feel you. We're desperate for you. And so God, we ask that you settle here with us right here in our bodies, in our minds, and in our soul as we learn from your word. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, you are my rock and my redeemer. And all of God's people said, amen. I truly, truly am so happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. But the house of the Lord is looking real different these days, right? Like this global pandemic is so impactful in all the ways that we've been learning about and it has literally changed the way that we worship. The house of the Lord is now my house, right? We're in my house right now. The house of the Lord is your house. It's all of our houses. The house of the Lord is outside. It's outside of church buildings. It's inside with limited capacity. And it's on YouTube Live like we are right now. Or it's on Instagram Live. Or it's on Zoom, Facebook, and so many other non-traditional platforms. And ultimately, Going into the house of the Lord now bears a whole new meaning in a way many of us, dare I say all of us, many of us, all of us did not see this coming. Now, however, Christians and clergy are heavily, are heavily, heavily, heavily convinced that they do see coming is the signs of the end of the world, the signs of end times, the end days, right? There was a recent survey 
of 1,000 pastors from evangelical and historical black denominations that took place January 24th through February 11th, 2020. So this was before the pandemic and the uprising. And this survey was to measure if these pastors believe that based on current events that we are living in the last days. This study showed that a vast majority of pastors, 97%, which is almost nine out of every 10 pastor in this set of research, believe that we are seeing signs of end times in current events. So this researcher categorized several lists of potential signs of Jesus' return that are described in various books of the New Testament. You've heard many of these. A few of them are, right, rise of false prophets and false teachings, traditional morals becoming less accepted, wars and national conflicts, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and other national, national, natural disasters, famine in the land, right? And many other things, right? But I don't think you or I are surprised at these findings, these findings that show that pastors and other Christian leaders are believing that we are seeing signs of the end time. But we might be surprised to know how long the Christian tradition has been thinking and believing that they too were living in the last days. As early as the first century, many Christians have not only been believing they were living in the last days, but various Christian scholars, clergy persons, priests, and others went as far as to predict when Jesus would return. Some ancient folks predicted that the second coming of Christ would come in the year 500, while a bit later, Pope Sylvester, along with many other Christian clergy, predicted Jesus would come back January 1st, 1000. Many, many, many years passed, still no sign of Jesus. Yet, it did not stop people within the Christian tradition from predicting Jesus' return. We go on and on and on. In 1260, 1370, 1504, 1673, 1700, 1836, 1901, 1914, 1930, 1982, 1999, and so on and so forth. Even now, in the year 2020, there are some Christians in our lifetime still predicting the second coming of Christ. According to some of these Christians, Jesus is coming back this year. We've already got so much going on. It's coronavirus, it's Black Lives Matter, it's all of the things happening. And for some Christian believers, they believe Jesus is also coming back this year. Some believers are thinking that Jesus is coming back next year, four years from now, five years from now. Someone has predicted that Jesus is coming back in 2029 and another in 2057. The point here is that Christians have been consumed since the existence of Christianity with eschatological matters. Eschatological matters just means matters pertaining to the end of the world. Just been obsessed with what is going to happen. When is Jesus going to come back? The end of the world. What is that going to look like? What are the signs, right? For thousands of years, we have been wondering this, believing we are seeing signs or for some predicting when Jesus is coming back. The Christian tradition, we've went through so many great lengths with intent of wanting to know the unknowable, of wanting to solve the unsolvable. And we have historically been challenged with staying present in our reality. This is because it's much more difficult to sit in the present reality, especially if it's a tough one, right? Especially when in a blink of an eye, our present reality has snatched away what many of us thought was our foundation. 
our present reality may have already been rocky. When your present reality is filled with rising death tolls from a global deadly virus, when racist police officers are killing black people and nearly zero consequences, unemployment rates skyrocketing, a capitalist system that insists on death and destruction, when your present reality is filled with wars and national conflicts, a rise of false prophets and false teachings, traditional morals becoming less accepted, earthquakes and other natural disasters. Folks aren't crazy. Folks are seeing signs. So of course, of course, for so many of us in this type of political, racist, white supremacist, fat phobic, sexist, misogynistic, all of these things in this kind of a climate, the depths of many of our souls can only see an end to this world. Can only see an end to this world, especially as we know it. So if our present reality may not be the end of the world, then what is it? And what in God's name am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to believe or think about life now? This present reality sucks. I don't like this present reality. You don't like this present reality. We don't like it here. We want it to be over. So the question lies, what are we to do about life now? And I believe that the prophet Jeremiah has some wisdom to share with us this morning. Um, so if you have your Bible or if you have your phone, turn with me to Jeremiah 29, verse 5. Only going over one verse because it's just so much here. So turn with me, Jeremiah 29, verse 5. Jeremiah is in the Old Testament. And it is after Isaiah, and it is before Lamentations. Jeremiah 29, 5. It reads this. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Jeremiah 29, 5 says, build houses and live in them plant gardens and eat what they produce. This is the word of God for the people of God and all of God's people said, thanks be to God. I wanna first begin with just a little bit of context about the book of Jeremiah. All of this is taking place around the seventh century BCE. And one of the things this book does is warn us of impending disaster. Then it tells us of that actual disaster, of the war, of the destruction, and the various ways people and their leaders responding to crises. Its 52 chapters are not in clear chronological order and repeat some of the same events. But throughout the book, there are instances of resistance to the empires of the time. And the empires of the time were Assyria, Babylon, and Persia. And we see here a pretty frustrated prophet that was dissatisfied with not only the rulers of his time, but the people of his time who were not consistently standing up for injustices in their midst. So the prophet Jeremiah and the people are searching together and separately to make some kind of sense of their experiences of war and violence, chaos and attempts at resistance, defeat in daily life. 
this group of people like us, just like us right now in this moment, we're searching together and separately, right? A lot of us are isolated in our homes by ourselves or the place that we're living by ourselves, right? So here we are in this passage. Jeremiah 29, right? Jeremiah writes a letter to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, which is in our text today, this is where folks are at. And the beginning of this letter essentially shares some extremely devastating news. Jeremiah essentially says, listen, y'all might as well go ahead and build your houses here, plant your gardens, because we're going to be here for a cool little minute. We aren't going anywhere anytime soon. We aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Soon. Verse 5 reads Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. He is letting the people know that, hey, I know y'all are anxious about going back to the way things were. I know you wish that we were getting ready to head back to Jerusalem. However, our reality is that you will be here for some time. We aren't going anywhere anytime soon. So how then are we to accept this? What does this mean for us that we aren't going anywhere anytime soon? Because let's just be honest here. This is not what we want to hear. Right? I can't speak for everybody, but I imagine this is not what most people want to hear today or any of the days to come. Right? As I imagine Jeremiah's response is not one that they wanted to hear nor accept. So how do we accept what we don't want to accept? How do we accept the unacceptable? I think first it is so important, so important for us to realize that accepting the unacceptable does not mean that we have to like it. Accepting the unacceptable does not mean that we have to like it. I don't see Jeremiah here today at the beginning of the letter saying, hey, let me tell y'all, like, y'all are about to love what I'm about to tell y'all. Like, for real, everybody come around, sit down, take a seat, like, Y'all are about to be like, hey, no, 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 no. That isn't, that's not what I see in this particular reading of the text this morning. I see Jeremiah simply telling them what is their new reality. He says, build your houses here. Plant your gardens here. Don't go build your house or plant your gardens back where you were at. Or don't build your house or plant your gardens where you wish you were at. Nor does Jeremiah say, build your house and plant your gardens where you think they should be. But he says here, right here, in our present new reality, 
I believe that in the midst of everything that is happening right now, there is still an invitation to build our houses. When someone is going to build a house, it's important to lay down a firm foundation, which oftentimes starts with something you can't even see on the surface. So right now in this moment, I'm literally talking about building a actual house, right? So when someone is building a house, oftentimes, you are laying a firm foundation, which oftentimes starts with something you can't even see on the surface. What is that thing you can't even see on the surface when you're building a house? A basement. A basement. A basement creates an underground, I'm not making this up, a basement creates an underground room that can be used as a storage and mechanical space and or finished to create a living area. Our house, right? The places that you cannot see, right? Some of you may have seen that, that, um, exercise where there's an iceberg and you just see the tip of the iceberg and then underneath it's like all of the things that you cannot see right when we see one another when we see one another now via zoom or facebook live or wherever it is that we might be virtually seeing someone we just see that tip of the iceberg right when you're looking at a house you just see the outside of that house but I believe God is inviting us right now in this moment to take a look underneath what's underground, what's at those foundational pieces of your life, what is under there, what's going on in the underground of our houses could right now be a time to build deeply and firmly to prepare for whatever is to come. I would say absolutely. It could be a great time to ask yourself some questions. What is in your basement? Did you know you had one? Is it too much down there to handle by yourself? Do you need to call an expert for help? Because once you got down there, you don't know what to do. Right now is a critical time for us to build, rebuild, reimagine the basement of our lives because here, underground, in those darker places, in those blind spots, in those non-visible corners, in those scarier unknown places of our mind, body, and souls is where we now possibly have some time to tend to. This can look like so many things. I'm a mental health therapist as well as a pastor. And so oftentimes what comes to my mind are often mental health type things, right? So some of the examples that I thought about, some things that we can do to look at what's underneath our house is addressing childhood wounds. Maybe this could be a time to learn about how the trauma you've experienced in your life hasn't just been yours, but that of your mothers, of your grandmothers, of your great-grandmothers, of your great-great-grandmothers, and so on, and so on, and so on. This could look like disrupting patterns in your life that you are so sick and tired of being sick and tired about. 
I don't know about you, but I got quite a few things that I'm so tired of. So, so tired of. This could be addressing those questions about our faith, about God, about the Bible that have kept us in fear, that have kept us in self-sabotage. Whatever it is, now, right now, is the time. In our reading of this passage today, I see Jeremiah doubling down on this notion of accepting the unacceptable by telling us in the rest of verse five to plant your gardens where they plant your gardens and eat what they produce. Excuse me, plant your gardens and eat what they produce. It's not saying here to plant your gardens where they used to be. It's not saying to plant your gardens where you wish they were. It's not saying to plant your gardens where you think they should be. But plant your gardens and eat what it produces right where you are. While you're planting your garden, it's important you know that what you see above ground in your plants is really determined by what's hidden underground. Here we are again, back underground. What's happening under there? What's happening underground? That's where the plant's roots live. Right? What happens under there drives plant growth. So this place that you can't see, that feels scary, that feels unknown, that you may not realize is there, that's, that's where the growth is going to really come. And that's the time we have to tend to these plants that we're gardening in the here and in the now. The bigger and healthier the root system, the bigger and the healthier the root system, the bigger and the healthier the plant. The bigger and healthier the root system, meaning this isn't just you. You don't have to do all of this by yourself. There is a whole team of people that are here to support you, right? There are church organizations. There are all kinds of organizations. There are people in your life. There are friends that you may have that are here to support you, to be a part of your healthier system, right? The more community connection that you have, the more healthier of a system that you are going to see. It's time, y'all, that to get our houses in order. Of course, I'm talking about our spiritual houses and our spiritual gardens. They just need so much tending to at this time. Please hear me when I say this, in this very present moment of time, there are so many ways to think about how to sustain, how to grow, how to even transform our spirit, our Christian walk, without being consumed and weighed down with misguided theology that says, Throw your hands up. There's nothing we can do because these are the signs of the end of times. And so we just are waiting until Jesus gets here. A misguided theology that has us biting our nails because we're so scared or pointing our finger at those who are clearly not going to be ready when Jesus comes. A misguided theology that is pushing extreme 
extreme Christian dogma that has people fighting all the wrong battles on a battlefield that's not even the Lord's. Accepting an unacceptable reality is no easy fleet. What I'm saying this morning is not easy. And it's important we remember that it's okay if we don't like it. We can actively be working towards changing it while we are accepting our new unacceptable reality. In fact, one of the other verses in this passage that we don't have time to get to today because it's a whole nother sermon, but I just at least want to want to put this, plant this in your spirit, if you will, that verse seven says, seek the welfare of the city. Pray to the Lord on its behalf because in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Right? Jeremiah has lots of things to say in this letter. And we can, again, this that'll preach a whole nother sermon, part two, that I'm probably going to preach at my church tomorrow in the in the in the evening but in all honesty we all know we all know that accepting this unacceptable this unacceptable reality can seem so impossible but it's not it's not we must know And remember that humanity has been here before. This may be new to us, but it is not new to humanity. Accepting the unacceptable requires the immense courage to be honest about exactly where we are. Not where we think we are, not where we wish we were, not where we should be, not where so-and-so is, but where we actually are. And it requires the fierce willingness to actually feel what's true, which can be excruciating, excruciating. But it is far more useful than avoiding such feelings by denying what we already know to be true. relaxing with what it what it what is put within us and knowing that this is not the way it's supposed to be however it is what it is how do we go on living life on life's terms. If it were up to me, I wouldn't do any of this. I love to think about everything else except for reality. I love to dream. I love to vision. In fact, those are some of my gifts that God has given me and I'm thankful for them. And I'm thankful for God's wisdom this morning that shares with us that accepting our present reality is vital to the houses that we are being called to build right now, to the gardens we're being called to plant right now. We can do this and we can do it together, together in community. We can go to the depths, right? We can go to the depths. I see and I believe the Lord calling us to the deep, to the deep where we accept the unacceptable, where we're building our houses here and planting our gardens here. And surely, and surely the one who created the heavens and the earth, when it was formless, then covered the face of the deep, 
surely, surely this creator, this God can sweep over the face of our deepest places with that wind that is in the very breath of our lungs. Let's hold this truth close. Let's keep it close to our hearts as we settle here. As we settle here, right here, right here together, right here, at least for a little while. To the one who is able to do exceedingly and, abund and abundantly above all we could ever ask or think, we say, Amen.